Actually, no, Gallo isn't there as clickbait. Hello, I am at Ryan and welcome to Ball in Europe. It's Monday and I'm in a mood to discuss mid-season arrivals to Europe, in specifically EuroLeague. And before we get into that, obviously you can see the three players we're going to mostly talk about. We will hint at others. But uh, the big thing I wanted all, you all to do first, though, if you could, please subscribe, hit that button, tell your friends. And now let's get into it with our first player we're going to discuss, Killian Hayes. So before we get on to Killian, why am I even doing this video? Well, I'm thinking of Kendrick Nunn's arrival last year. It was at that point where the NBA season was starting. Nunn didn't have the home he wanted to have. And he came in and, of course, was an enormous shift in the dynamic of the entire EuroLeague season, really. So I think we're going to see some in-season arrivals. Obviously, who can do it and why they'll do it and who they'll sign will vary wildly. And that's where I'm going to start with Killian Hayes because he's become a lot more interesting over really the last 24 hours. He was already interesting really going into the weekend where we saw he's looking likely for a GLE contract. But obviously, as soon as he didn't get a full-time NBA contract, you know the offices in, uh, for Aswell and for Paris were both alert thinking, can we do something here? Can we find a way to bring him in? Paris obviously getting some good crowds in early this season want to build in that momentum because they're still like a really young club overall and building that culture in Paris of people coming along to see having a you know a French star a guy who's legitimately like you know played at a high level but who's also young and can appeal to that younger demographic is going to be very fascinating to them and also yeah he can deliver in basketball so Paris know they can plug him in reasonably quickly for Asvel as well they're obviously very French focused with their roster too they jump out as a team that will want to get Killian Hayes because again they might feel well, listen, you know, a lot of people didn't rate us coming into this season, me included, and maybe he brings us up a level. So, and of course, for both those sides, they're trying to chase down Monaco in the French League as well, remember, in the LNB, and they're thinking, like, you know, well, well can we win more trophies possibly, even domestically, by adding a Killian Hayes? So, in France alone, there's immediately some reason to think there will be interest in Killian Hayes. But the other team that now has jumped out to me is... Uh, FC Barcelona, who I would not have had close to this prior to uh, Lapro's terrible ACL injury at the weekend against Basconi. And obviously, big love to Lapro. Best of luck with the recovery, mate. Because suddenly there's a guard opening there. Like, Lapro's meant to miss the whole season now. And, you know, Barcelona needs someone who they know can deliver. Now, the big question with Hayes there is, obviously, he's still young. And Barcelona would probably favor bringing in a veteran signee there as opposed to a still a young dude whose eyes are on the NBA. But at the same time, options get limited to some degree this time of year. And also, a player of Killian Hayes' talent, when he becomes available, you're going to take a serious look at him. Now, Barcelona have been a bit tighter with the books the last summer or so, because obviously the way things have changed in that club as a whole. But this is sort of a, I wouldn't say, well, you yeah, know, I would say panic situation where they realize that like a key, key piece of their entire look, their entire dynamic, is now gone for the season. Killian Hayes, not the type of swap out they would normally look at if the situation was ideal, might be the type of swap out they look at in this obviously exactly the opposite of ideal scenario. So there's three landing spots that jump out to me where I'm thinking Hayes is going to draw interest. And I think all three teams will find a way to make the money work. And obviously NBA outs will be written into this like crazy. Uh, but um, yeah, so both situations there, I'm thinking... Hayes, Europe, plausible, but not the one I'm most confident in seeing happening. So Frank Kaminsky has been waived by the Suns, and of course he had his European debut season last year with Partizan. I suppose the summation of his performance would be fine. Uh, he obviously went back hoping to do well in the NBA, but uh, the big thing for Frank is who can he work with and where is he best suited? So a few things come to mind. Obviously, it's who needs front court shooting. And uh, a lot of people do, is the short version. Like, Maccabi jumps out there straight away as a team that could really benefit with another front court shooter. Uh, but uh, not, of, uh, not the thing I'm thinking of as the most likely landing spot there. And then you look elsewhere. Uh, uh, FS, again, could do it at front court shooting. But uh, they've been pretty clear that, as far as they're concerned, their business for the year is done. So you go, right, okay. Then you go to Italy and it gets really interesting where Virtus and Milano both look like sides 
that need front court shooting. And both sides obviously struggling a combined one and seven to start the EuroLeague campaign. And both sides are the types that have been willing to make the big move before to bring in a big name player. And so, yeah, yeah, you know, you kind of go, right, I could see Virtus looking at this, particularly like with a coach like Luca Banki, if they aren't planning on cutting ties with him. Uh, I'm not a big fan of early season firing as a coach, just to be clear. Uh, if you're going to pull that trigger, I'm sorry, just wait it out a bit, because I don't think an in-season change of coach with your situation is going to change things at this point of the season. Uh, and if you are going to do it, like, run it out a bit more. Uh, you have time. But yeah, so if they are committed to staying with Luca Banki, and I'm a big Luka Banki fan here, obviously. A Frank Kaminsky could change the dynamic for that Virtus team an awful, awful lot. But the biggest landing spot for me, which is what we're really getting to, is Real Madrid. Uh, oddly, for a team that is so backcourt loaded, and we've already seen they are looking elsewhere, like, you know, Lonnie Harris, I believe, is the latest player they're looking at for bringing in players. They really aren't having... They're, they're lacking shooting, basically. And obviously, they've got injuries to deal with, like Usman Garuba being the most notable one. So even though their roster is frontcourt heavy, there isn't a lot of frontcourt shooting there. And Kaminsky, to me, looks like a guy who can come off the bench and do a job really, really quickly. Uh, so again, not the worst option to have. So like, there's a lot of places I kind of go, well, Frank just makes sense. And it doesn't seem like he's too keen on taking the G League route. Uh, like, he's not said anything in particular, but I think he wants... NBA, basically, or at least a two-way deal. Like, not a pure G League group for him. Uh, and good for him, just to be clear, if that is the case. But, uh, yeah, so I could see a lot of European interest in Frank Kaminsky coming up because there's, like, you know, really, you know, there's nowhere where I don't think he could make a difference. Like, Bayern came to mind, but the issue with Bayern is budget, basically. I don't think they can fiscally put together what they need for this to happen. And, again, there's almost a fit issue there because the shooting front court isn't really their issue. Uh, you know, and also ball handling front court is a case of what, how much ball would Frank need? Because, like, you know, they, they, they have guys who are going to use that ball quite a lot in the front court already. So people might be thinking Bayern. I don't think the money is there, uh, or at least not this season. Uh, had he been available in the summer, could have been a different story. Um, but I also think that uh, the look and the fit isn't right there. So that's why I'm thinking Real Madrid would be a very, very interesting landing spot for Frank Kaminsky. Now we're getting to the reason why you're wondering why I put Gallo in the cover pick to begin with. Gallo is part of what seems to be a dying breed, which is the Euro with absolutely no interest in coming home uh, under any circumstances. Like, I'd have thought an Evan Fournier was in there. I'd have definitely thought a Shetty Osman was in there. Both of them have come home. And I really had Gallo uh, as possibly, you know, you know, no, no different to them in terms of attitude. Like, for those of you who forget, like Gallo missed his entire first season with the Celtics, ended up with the Wizards, uh, you know, didn't play much basketball, and he's now 36. And so I kind of got, well, is Gallo going to play again in the NBA? And uh, the answer is, it turns out more than likely, he's just, according to the New York Post, uh, uh, got in a new place in Brooklyn, a nice look suite apparently. And that is linking nicely to all the rumors that he's back with the Knicks this season. So I think we can rule out the Gallo coming home thing. But you may be saying, no one was saying Gallo was coming home. And you're right. That's kind of what jumps out to me. There was not a hint at all over the whole summer, over the whole offseason of Danilo Gallinari being on anyone's radar. And you think about how much this hype machine we had around all the Euros coming in got and coming back from the NBA got. Yet Danilo Gallinari, who, in terms of contract, there was a lot of logic that could make sense. Like, if you look at Monaco's financial situation, the tax breaks, Gallo's last contract, how that worked out after tax, suddenly you see what Gallo was earning on a per annum basis isn't that difference with what the actual, like, the net money. Like, you got to ignore the gross money in an NBA contract. Remember how tax factors in. You remember what Monaco and its tax haven status, essentially, works out as and suddenly that gap is very short and it's like oh oh that, that could have actually worked like gallo to monaco would have made a lot of sense like you know front court shooting it adds certainly an area they could definitely do would help again though a roster by the way that's very settled but to me it's more of a case of i'm surprised we didn't see that uh, move be shouted about at all over the summer for example and oddly i think it shows a bit of maturity in how we cover 
uh, transactions and player movements. I know, I am praising the media and the basketball business world. These are things you did not expect because no one tried to hype up the Gallo to anyone move or Gallo on the radar stuff. Uh, no one tried to make a thing out of it. The agent never even leaked a hint about it because if they had, it would have been somewhere. Uh, the Gallo never made any reference to it. And no journalist decided to go off on a flyer and say, ooh, let's do Gallo. Like, even my video, like, I have an X over Gallo in it to try and emphasize that I'm not saying Gallo's coming home. For me, I was very surprised and kind of impressed at how we didn't hype up the potential Gallo, say, to Milano, uh, which uh, is very much a hot mess of a club right now. Because, of course, it's only like 30 kilometers, I think, from where he's uh, from in Italy. And, uh, you know... I even like went and chat GBT, looked up like good cities for golf courses. Madrid would have been a good landing spot, it turns out. Uh, so would Monaco. Uh, so there you go, because of course we all know Gallo loves his golf. Him and Gareth Bale, bros forever. Uh, but um, yeah, so isn't it nice that, uh, you know, in a world that's made of transfer and trade rumors and signing rumors and all that, that one of the easiest ones that people could have created stories around would have definitely generated like crazy amounts of discussions, didn't because we had nothing to work with. That's. I just think that's a good thing. Uh, I like good things. I like maturity in the media, and that's great. Uh, yeah, so I did have chats with my buddy Lewis, by the way, repeatedly saying, oh, he's not signed yet, he's not signed yet. But there's a very different between WhatsApping a mate saying this could be interesting versus tweeting, hey, you know, I think I did tweet once, you know, Danilo Gananari hasn't got a contract. I think I did tweet that once. But that was me throwing that into the ether and very clearly stating, unless you're really can't, you know, understand... I hadn't got a clue. I just said, hey, let's just see what happens here. And no one bit. So, yeah, I mean, maturity. I was possibly the least mature person in European media when it came to Gallo, which I think is always a good result. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's great. So will we see more mid-season signings or in-season signings, really, because we're still in the early stage? I think we're going to see one or two. I don't know if it'll be any of the, the, the two I mentioned today, because we're not counting Gallo, obviously. Uh, Hayes, I have a feeling, is more eager to try and stick it out in the NBA at least for one more year. Uh, even if it is a full G League year. Uh, Kaminsky, I think, is open to anything. So Asia is definitely going to be something he considers if a China or Japan offer comes along that makes financial sense to him. And, uh, you know, but obviously I think a Euro offer would be very appealing to him. So, yeah, I, by the way, no, I'm not even considering part of Zander Frank. Uh, two reasons. One, he left there and they've changed so much. They're in a chemistry situation now. You know, they've got to get everybody to gel, and adding another body right now is the last thing they want to do. Let's get the 15 they have working together if you're partisan. Zvezda, oddly, because he's an ex partisan player, I was thinking probably not. And again, they've probably hit the max of what they want to spend for this year. So, yeah, it's, it's a bit of you sort of, you know, factoring in the what would stop it thing, you know, with a lot of these talks. But someone's going to move to somewhere. Uh, that's going to be a big, big signing. I think we might see bigger than Lonnie, just to be clear. Uh, Lonnie seems to be the big one people are talking about, uh, Lonnie Walker. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, so who will it be? Hey, why not tell me in the comments who you think it'll be? And, by the way, you might have noticed we've got a lot more shorts lately. So they're from my travels out Irish media, Irish basketball, and also to Iceland and a few other places. We're going to be doing a few more of those. Feel free to check out the Irish shorts. They're always a bit of crack. Uh, but uh, one very last thing. This cap today is Collingwood Football Club, uh, Aussie Rules, down under. And the reason I'm wearing this is because I'm recording this on the anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. I'm not some British imperialist or anything but, but a mildly. I'm wearing it because literally the name Collingwood. So Collingwood was the guy who received, well, was one of the captains who received the message uh, from Nelson that was sent via uh, flag signals. And it was basically England expects that every man shall do his duty. To which Collingwood's response uh, to one of his subordinates was, what does he think we're doing? So I just like that sort of, yeah, stick it to the man. <laughs> Good man, Collingwood. But yeah, Collingwood FC is named for that Collingwood. So lovely bit of in-universe stuff for you all here. Uh, anyway, listen, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Tell your friends. And of course, on Wednesday is the next video. I haven't decided what that's going to be yet. Probably going to be NBA-focused and Euros and NBA-focused. But we'll see. But until then, I will see you soon.